Please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1, our text this morning will be the first four verses of this first letter that John writes to his people. And this morning we begin our, our fall series through these letters that John writes. And part of the, the focus of what we are trying to do is to gain what our confession of faith calls an infallible assurance of faith, a, a trustworthy Assurance. How is it that we know that we have eternal life? How is it that we know that we have confidence that, in fact, Jesus is mine? That's, that's our focus through the fall. And after this Sunday, you'll notice each of the sermon titles will be posed as a question that the text raises that's meant to stir up our hearts to, to not only examine ourselves, but also to, to press into the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we might no, that's, that's why John wrote the letter. He says it at the end of this letter in chapter 5 that he writes these things that you might know you have eternal life. And so that's our, that's our heart's desire through the fall is that we might examine our own hearts, we might be encouraged, and we might have this clear sense, yes, I know I'm a new person in Jesus Christ. And because I'm a new person, I live differently as a result, both here in the context of the church, and my family, and my community, uh, as new people living out this gospel for a new Memphis. But in order for all that to happen for us, we, we need God's help this morning. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. So let's ask him for it, shall we? Let's pray together. Almighty God, we do come asking that you would pour out your spirit once again upon us. Lord, may your word be accompanied by your spirit in such a way that our eyes of faith might be opened and we would see glorious riches in this portion of your gospel. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. She couldn't see. For her entire life, 94 years, she could not see. She was only six weeks old when she developed an eye infection that was treated with the, the best medicine of the day, a mustard poultice that left her blind. She couldn't see, but she would go to school at the New York Institute for the Blind. Later, she would teach there for 11 years. During that time, she would recite verse to a young man who was a secretary at that school, and he would write her verses down, a young man known as Grover Cleveland, future president of the United States. She couldn't see. But one day, she was over at a friend's house, a lady named Phoebe Knapp, Ms. Knapp was having an organ installed in her home, and while the installation was going on, she wandered over to the piano, began to play a tune. After she played it several times, she asked the blind woman, what does that tune say to you? And after a moment's thought, the blind woman, whom you know as Fanny Crosby, said, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Because, of course, Fanny Crosby was blind. And yet, 
in Jesus Christ, she could see. Have you ever wondered at the words that the blind woman wrote? Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. How did that happen? It happened because in Jesus Christ, a blind woman could see. Isn't it striking that a blind woman could see clearly Jesus Christ, and yet so many of us who can see yet remain blind when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to our own spiritual state. Such blindness is why John is writing this letter and the two that follow it, 2nd and 3rd John. These letters that we find here towards the back of our Bibles. The churches to whom he has addressed what appears to be a circular letter are plagued by false teachers and those who follow him, who have followed them, who have slid into a, a, a failure of orthodoxy when it comes to doctrine. These false teachers claim that Jesus was not the Messiah, that he had not come in the flesh, that he was not the Son of God, that he had not made atonement, he was not the atoning sacrifice for the sins of his people. And they developed a following. But I suspect that the following came not simply because the false teachers were unorthodox doctrinally, they were also unorthodox morally. They told people that they were already perfect in their spirit, so it didn't matter what they did with their bodies. They could engage, engage their sexual appetites. They could indulge their material desires. It didn't matter. And because these false teachers and their followers were unorthodox doctrinally and morally, they separated themselves socially. They would abandon the apostolic churches. In fact, they hated the apostolic teaching, the apostolic lifestyle. You see, these false teachers whom John is going to warn us concerning in this letter, they thought they could see. And those who followed these false teachers thought they could see that they gained some insight, some wisdom, but in fact they were blind. They thought they were on the right path, but really they were on the highway to hell. But these false teachers not only created this difficulty for those who followed them, there was a second difficulty that resulted as a result of these false teachers and, and those who followed them. It, they caused those who could actually see to begin to doubt. There were many who had come to embrace John's teaching and the teaching of the other apostles. There were many who had come to embrace the apostolic lifestyle. They could truly see what it was to believe in Jesus Christ and to follow him. They really were trusting in Jesus. And yet, when they heard these false teachers and they saw the many who were following them, they began to doubt. They began to wonder. Maybe, maybe we got it wrong. Maybe, maybe we didn't actually understand what it was that the Apostle John was teaching us. Maybe we had followed this way, and we should have followed what these false teachers were saying. And, it, and so it's in, especially in order to provide assurance for these genuine believers who are in danger, potentially being led astray by the false teachers and those who follow them. It's for, it's for them that John writes this letter. You'll notice it at the end of the letter in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things I have written to you, he says... To you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you might know you have eternal life. John wrote this letter so that his people might be able to say, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I would suggest to you this morning that, that in our own day and for our own hearts, this is, this is needful. We need to come to a letter like 1 John and the two short letters that follow, 2nd and 3rd John, in order to hear once again, yes, the gospel of Jesus, but also to examine our own hearts. Because the fact of the matter is, there are some here this morning who think they can see, but in fact are actually blind. You've been following your own path and carving out your own version of Christianity whether doctrinally, morally, socially, you think you can see, 
but you actually don't see rightly. And throughout this letter, John wants to, to challenge you, to cause you to examine your heart so that you might run after Jesus Christ. But I suspect for most of us, those of us who've, who've come to see the truth as it is in Jesus, who, who believe that Jesus is, a, was, is the God-man, who lived and died for sinners like us, was raised again the third day bodily for our salvation, who has ascended to the right hand of the Father. As you have seen him go, so he shall return, the angel said at the beginning of Acts. We, we trust him, we see him, and yet there are times where we wonder, is it true? Is it real? And John wants to help us. He wants us by the end of this letter, having asked and answered the questions he wants to pose to us, he wants us to say at the end of it all, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Here in this passage this morning, John does that in two ways. He seeks to point us to this blessed assurance in two ways. One is an objective way. The other is more subjective. The objective way that he points us towards an infallible assurance of faith, a confidence that Jesus is mine, is he tells us that assurance is rooted in the truth of the gospel. Now, I don't know about you, but, but the first several times you, I read this out loud over this past week in preparing, I, I felt like the first several verses are of John's letter are pretty awkward. It's hard to know exactly what John is saying. They're a little complicated, aren't they? We might be able to get a little bit more clarity if we, if we take a, a two-word phrase that he's used repeatedly and, and put it right there at the beginning. We proclaim. So that suddenly it reads, we proclaim that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and so forth. Because what John is trying to do for us is he's, he's trying to proclaim a message. A message that will anchor our hearts in this assurance of faith. Might, might grant us confidence that in fact we do know Jesus. We have trusted in him. We do have eternal life. And this message that John is proclaiming to us, this message that is true truth, is a message about a person who is real. I don't know about you, but that first phrase echoes back for me to other places in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here, that which was from the beginning. In the beginning, God. In the beginning was the Word, that which was from the beginning. It seems as though these echoes from Genesis to the Gospel of John to 1 John are intentional. But whereas in the Gospel of John, John wants to echo back to creation to say that this word who became flesh is in fact God who existed before time was. Here, in 1 John, he's reaching back to the beginning of the incarnation. And he's saying that this eternal one, this one who made the heavens and the earth, he is the one who became flesh in Jesus Christ. And he is the one we proclaim to you. Our gospel is about a person who is real. Jesus Christ was a historical person. And in fact, what, what John wants to do for us is to give us three lines of evidence that, for, that should, should give us confidence, that should give us a sense of proof that in fact Jesus is real. First he says, we heard Jesus. You see it? Verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. For three years, they heard Jesus' voice. They heard Jesus' teaching. They heard his commandments. They heard his rebukes. They, they heard Jesus. But they not only heard Jesus, they also saw Jesus. Three different ways. John says this. Verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon. Verse 2, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard. That's important. These apostles have heard Jesus, yes, but they also saw him. They saw him as a 
as he walked. They saw him as he talked. They saw him as he slept. They saw him as he ate. They saw him as he hung on the cross. They saw him buried. They saw him after he was raised from the dead. They both heard Jesus and they saw him and they touched him. That's the third line of evidence. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands. This is no mere ghost, in other words. No, Jesus Jesus rubbed shoulders with the apostles. The apostles hugged him. They fell at his feet and touched those feet. You remember that when Jesus came in, uh, into the upper room, what was it that he said to Thomas? Put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand. Place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. In other words, touch me. So that these three lines of evidence, hearing, seeing, touching, they persuaded John, the apostle, and the other apostles that they were dealing with a real person. The God-man who entered into history, into space and time. And this good news, this gospel, it centers on a real person. Your faith is anchored in this reality that Jesus Christ is real. A real, historical, living, breathing person who lived 2,000 years ago. It's objective truth. But our assurance not only centers on, on the truth that Jesus was a real person, it also centers on the truth of, that was proclaimed to us. We've, we've trusted in the Apostle's proclamation. The Apostle John and in verse 2, uses two different phrases to get at this, this reality that he is, and the other apostles are proclaiming a message concerning Jesus. You see it in verse 2. The life was made manifest. We have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life. So testify could also be translated bear witness. That, that Greek word that sits behind that English translation is important for John. It shows up 33 times in the Gospel of John. It shows up six times here in this letter. And he uses this word to stress that when the apostles were giving witness, when they were testifying, it was though they were giving testimony in a court of law. It's, it was public truth to which they witnessed. Something that could be tested and adjudicated. Something that could be proven false or true. So that when they proclaimed the truth as it is in Jesus, that Jesus is a real historical person who lived and died and was raised again for sinners like you and me, they were testifying and proclaiming something that could be tested. It could be tried. They bore witness, but they also proclaimed. The apostles had the responsibility to proclaim the truth of the gospel to their generation. Jesus had told them uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And then when you pick up from there, and Jesus ascends back to the Father, what is the rest of the Acts of the Apostle all about? It's about them preaching. It's about them proclaiming the truth as it is in Jesus. The Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys, what does he do? First thing, any town he gets to, he goes to the synagogue and does what? He proclaims the truth concerning this Jesus who is a real historical person who fulfilled all that God had said in the Old Testament. That's what they were to do. But listen, that means that your assurance rests upon the truth of what they proclaimed. Your assurance that you belong to Jesus, that you have eternal life, rests in the truth of what they proclaim. Which means there has to be a truth that's outside of yourself, doesn't it? It means the truth isn't what you make up. It's not reader response. It's not your truth that's set against somebody else's truth. No, there is a true truth in the world. There is an objective reality in this world, and his name is Jesus, and he lived and died and was raised again for sinners like you and me. 
Your salvation and your assurance of your salvation rests upon truth. And where do you find the truth? You find the truth in God's word, in the Bible. Which means you need to know the truth. For far too many of us, the only time you open this book of truth is on Sunday morning. And you come to church and you bring your Bible or you use the Pew Bible or you use your phone and you open it up and then you close it and then you don't open it again until the following Sunday. And then you wonder why you struggle with assurance. And you wonder why you struggle with doubts and fears. And you wonder why your children question whether you really believe what you say you believe. Friends, if our salvation and the assurance of our salvation is rooted in truth, in this objective reality that these things are so outside of ourself, you need to know the book. And you need to know the story, not just the facts of the story, but so that it's in your bones. And when you come up against any problem, the first question you ask is, what does this Bible say? That's our only anchor. Because our, our, the assurance of our salvation is rooted in truth, the very truth of God. But it's notable that John doesn't stop there. You see, there's, there's two bases. There's this objective basis that, that assurance is rooted in the truth of the gospel. But there's also this subjective basis that our assurance of faith is actually rooted in the work of the gospel and especially the work of the gospel in us and through us. In verse 3, John uses this word fellowship. You see it there in your Bibles. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now that word fellowship, that's, that's that Greek word you might have heard once or twice, koinonia. It's not used very often by John, only four times in this letter and all four times in this chapter. And yet it's, a, it's an important word. That word fellowship has the idea of an intimate relationship. An intimate relationship that actually produces shared activity. So that when the gospel is at work in us, it inevitably does its work in such a way that it works through us. There's a, there's a vertical reality that then moves to a horizontal reality. John says in verse 3, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. In other words, vertically speaking, we have a, an intimate relationship with the Father through the Son, Jesus, by the Spirit. And perhaps here John has in the back of his mind words from the Upper Room Discourse, which he gives us in John chapter 13 through 17, but especially the high priestly prayer that Jesus prays in John 17. In the midst of that prayer, Jesus had said that they may also be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. How is it that the world will believe that Jesus had been sent by the Father for the salvation of the world? Certainly it will be tied to, to doctrinal truth, to objective truth. That's important. But what Jesus says ultimately is that objective truth has to take root in our hearts in such a way that we have a real relationship with the Father through the Son by the Spirit so that as the Father is in the Son and as the Son is in the Spirit, we're in God and God is in us. There's that kind of tight union and communion, real relationship between God and us. I wonder if that's the case for you this morning. Do you have a real, vital relationship with God through Jesus by the Spirit? Do you? Not just, yeah, I know Jesus, intellectually speaking, but do you have a real, vital relationship, a fellowship? A, a, a real fellowship with, with the God who's come to us in Jesus Christ by the Spirit? Do you? The only way you will gain a, a, an assurance of faith that's trustworthy 
is yes, to anchor yourself on the objective truth of the gospel, but also in the light of that truth, for that truth to take root in your heart in such a way that you long for and you desire and you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ as he is work, at work in you and you are living out your life in him. But John also says that, yes, we have fellowship with God, but, but that fellowship with God, that work in us is expressed through us to one another. We have fellowship with one another. He says, so that, verse 3, so that you too may have fellowship with us. That's particularly important in John's context. As the false teachers had led various people astray, as they had separated themselves out socially, as they stood in opposition to the apostles' teaching and their lifestyle and to those who remained loyal to the apostles' teaching and lifestyle. And it's going to be reflected time and time again in John's letters that a, that a distinguishing mark of genuine believers in Jesus Christ is their love for one another. Not just love and as an emotion, although it's not less than an emotion. Not just love in, in terms of saying, oh, I love you. Love you, brother. Love you, sister. Not a love that's in, in talking, but a love that is, that's lived out in walking. Not just a love that's in words, but a love that's in deed and in truth, John will say. Which means if we're going to have this blessed assurance, if we're able to say Jesus is mine, there has to be both this object of reality, I know the truth of the gospel, but also the subject of reality. The gospel has been at work in me in such a way that I have a real vital relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And it evidences itself in the way I live with others, with my fellow church members, with my family, in the workplace. It changes us from the inside out. So that's, that's my question for you this morning. Here at the end of the service, we're going to be singing Fanny Crosby's gospel song, Blessed Assurance. When you sing that, will it be truthful for you? I mean, really, will, when you actually sing that, will you be able to claim those words as your own? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. I mean, can you sing that with any kind of authenticity? I trust you can. Many of you can. And you'll be singing it with gusto because you're saying, yes, this is true. The Spirit's been at work in me, the very Spirit of Jesus, so that I both believe that this gospel is objectively true and it's taken root in my heart and it's evidenced in my life. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. But for some of you, will you be a fraud when you sing that? Will you be a hypocrite? I mean, do you have a real, vital relationship with Jesus? Do you? Are you blind? Or can you see? Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we confess that the only way we could ever stand before you is not on the basis of our doctrinal knowledge, not even on the basis of the holiness of our life. The only way we can stand before you is your mercy, which you declare to us time and time and time again through this gospel of Jesus. Lord, please... Please may this good news, this message concerning Jesus, that is a message that transforms our hearts and lives, may this be real for us. May it change us. May we be different as a result, but may it always bring us back again and again to your mercy. Grant that it would be so, we ask. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.